if it wasn't for China, they would have died. They would have all gone bankrupt. So it was Chinese demand for German exports that kept Germany alive. Well, allow me first to say that um, there is no doubt in my mind that Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, is an embarrassment for us Europeans. She doesn't speak for us. You have to remember, we never elected her. <laughs> she was imposed on us by Chancellor Merkel and President Macron. Europe is not a democracy, whatever uh, they may be telling the people of China. Um, it's less of a democracy than China is. Uh, think about it, you know, two men and two women got together in a room and they decided that Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen, a failed defense minister from Germany, the chancellor of Germany at the time didn't want to have in Berlin around her. She got rid of her and you know, sent her to Brussels to be, to be the president of the European Commission. And, you know, when Ursula von der Leyen goes, for instance, to Israel and stands in front of the tanks of the IDF, of the Israeli army, cheerleading them just before they enter Gaza to kill tens of thousands of children, that just goes to show the ex what I was saying to you, that she's an embarrassment to Europeans. Another point that I need to raise is that, you know, you mentioned her trip to China and the de-risking narrative. That wasn't even hers. It didn't come from Europe. This came from Washington. It was the American instruction to Ursula von der Leyen that, you know what, you will need essentially to break your trading bonds with China. This was an instruction that came from the United States. German, you, you said something that I don't agree with. You said that the that the European right didn't want trade relations with China. That's not true. If you talk to any industrialist, any industrialist, any industrialist in China, they really want <laughs> trade relations. Actually, not only do they only want trade relations with China, their survival depend depends on trade relations with China. They're nothing nothing short of their economic life <laughs> depends on. Uh, Chinese trade. Uh, if you think of going back to 2008, when uh, the American economy collapsed, and simultaneously, the periphery of the European Union, countries like mine, Greece, Italy, they went all bankrupt. Suddenly, German industry had no one to sell their products to. If it wasn't for China, they would have died. They would have all gone bankrupt. So it was Chinese demand for German exports that kept Germany alive. And, you know, German industrialists, if way, even if they're right, very right-wing, know that, appreciate that. But they got their marching orders from Washington, cut trade with China. Ursula von der Leyen knows this. She knows that it is impossible for Europe to maintain its economic energy and to move towards the green transition, electrification, let's say, of transport, battery technology, without trading with China. She knows that. But she doesn't care because Ursula von der Leyen, and this is um, a very controversial statement that I'm going to issue now, but I'm going to make it because I believe st strongly that, she doesn't work for Europeans, she works for the Americans. She works for the American administration. And she comes to China and tells you that which has been given to her as a briefing from Washington, D.C. And, you know, if Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, knows that and dislikes that very, very much. Olaf Scholz is not in agreement with Ursula von der Leyen. Olaf Scholz, remember, he came to China. He brought German businessmen to give you exactly the opposite message, that we do not want to de-risk and to delink from China. We want, but, the, and here is the conundrum of Europe. Olaf Scholz is the elected chancellor of, of Germany and he has less power than the unelected president of the European Commission who takes her marching orders from Washington. So should you expect a deterioration? Well, look, it's up to us here in Europe to rise up against Mrs. von der Leyen, who, by the way, is going to be reappointed again because there is a lot of support that she has from Washington, D.C. It's up to us Europeans, uh, activists, politicians, citizens, to stop our European leaders from turning Europe into a colony of the United States, which the United States uses in order to up the ante, to intensify the new Cold War between the United States and China. We need an independent Europe. We need a Europe that minds after Europe and the world. 
because if we do mind after Europe, then we will de-escalate the new Cold War that the United States is uh, unleashing against China. And this is our job to do here as Europeans. Uh, what should the Chinese people expect? They should You should expect the worst because uh, Europe is not going in, a, in, a, in, a, in the right direction. You should understand that it's not the European people who are turning our politics against China. It is our rulers. We are not sovereign nations anymore. You know, here in Greece in 2015, <laughs> the people of Greece decided uh, to go another way. 62% of the vote was against the the standard line, which I am describing now. And what happened was the people were overthrown. <laughs> so we need uh, international solidarity against very pernicious business interests who are trying very hard to ferment the Cold War between West and West, between the West and China, you know, the West and, and China in particular. We need uh, to stop them from essentially undermining the conditions that would allow, you know, humanity to to create a, a, a better future for itself. Thank you so much. Talking about saving humanity, I know that you are you still banned from Germany for standing up for Palestine. You know, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> this is the state the state of affairs in Europe. Uh, very briefly for you to know, I have taken the German government to the courts in Germany because they won't tell me. I was told verbally, not me personally, my comrades, my collaborators in Germany were told that I was banned by the police in Berlin, by a high-ranking police officer. And uh, I was told that not only was I banned, I would be arrested if I entered Germany, but also that they would be arrested if they hosted me over video link, as you and I are speaking now, that if any German spoke to me in a public meeting over video link, they would be arrested. Now, you know, this is like a statement by the German government, the German police, that totalitarianism is here and it is ruling over Europe. And so there is the, the small tiny detail that supposedly we live in the European Union where there's freedom of movement. But my freedom of movement has been revoked by the German police verbally. So my lawyer wrote to the government, to the Ministry of um, the Interior, and asked for details and asked three very important questions, simple questions. Which authority banned me? When? And why? And what was the rationale? And we got a letter a day later saying that they will answer us within 48 hours in writing. In 48 hours, we got a letter saying, Dear Mr. Valkyrgyz, we are not going to answer your questions because that would go against national security. So I'm taking them to court <laughs> in order to ascertain my right to know if I am still banned, who banned me and why. But of course, you know, the reason why they are delaying is because they are embarrassed. But imagine if they do this to me, given that I have a high profile. I speak to you, I speak to journalists, BBC and so on. Imagine if they are, if they feel free to do this against me, to violate basic, basic law against me. Imagine what they will do to people who do not have a public platform, who are not well known, who do not have... Uh, my capacity to communicate uh, these matters. Europe is becoming a very bleak place. They advocate human rights and the rule of law and do whatever they want, whenever they want, in violation of human rights and the rule of law. Yeah.